employment directly in the steel industry. Minister. Uh, yes, I'm happy to provide that confirmation. Thank you. That ends the ministerial statement. We now move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by Aileen MacLeod on the Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emissions Annual Target Report 2013 and report on progress towards meeting the interim target. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Can I just point out to members, in the previous statement, I unfortunately had to drop three members who wished to ask a question because we'd run out of time. Can you bear that in mind when you're asking your questions? Uh, I now call on Ailey McLeod. Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2009, uh, this Parliament acted unanimously to enshrine world-leading climate change targets in legislation. Now, we were supported by huge numbers of people across Scotland in business, public sector, academia, in NGOs, in schools, in trade unions, in communities and in homes. And through this collective high ambition, we were able to establish world-leading targets of a 42% cut in emissions by 2020 and 80% by 2050. Scotland was also the first national government in the world to establish a climate justice fund. I am proud of these actions, presenting officer, and of Scotland's ambition. Continued ambition and action are required from all of us if we are to tackle the environmental harm and social injustices caused by climate change. And through the recent Scottish Leaders' Climate Change Pledge, we have again, as political parties, shown our collective commitment to tackle this challenge. And across Scotland, many people are doing the same, taking action as individuals, as families, as communities and as organisations. The Scottish Government is also committed and is leading by example. Our Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change demonstrates our commitment to tackling this issue at the highest level within government. We have pledged around a billion pounds of funding over two years, 2014-15 and 2015-16, for climate change action. We have in place a comprehensive package of measures to meet our climate change targets out to 2027. Taking action, planning officer on climate change, we are investing in our people, our environment and our economy, creating a fairer and more prosperous Scotland. We are reducing the amount of energy people use. We're already below the consumption level required to meet our 2020 12% target, seven years ahead of schedule. We are reducing levels of fuel poverty and since 2009 we have allocated over half a billion pounds on a range of fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes with a budget of £119 million for the current financial year. And in June I announced this would be a national infrastructure priority for government. Now we are reducing our dependence on fossil fuels by scaling up renewable energy and Scotland now generates almost half of its electricity demand from renewables. And in 2014, the amount of heat generated by renewables in Scotland grew by 36%. We are focused on community and locally owned energy, last month reaching our 2020 target of 500 megawatts of community renewables five years early. Across Scotland, nearly 45,000 people are employed in the low carbon economy and its supply chain. Taking action to reduce emissions from transport compared to 2013-14, we have increased investment in active travel by over 80%. We are committed to rail electrification. We are working with partners to deliver our electric vehicle roadmap, with more electric vehicles being sold in Scotland than ever before. We are encouraging waste reduction, extending recycling and reducing the waste to landfill. And in 2014, 42.8% of Scotland's household waste was composted, recycled or reused. And for the first time, landfilling of household waste fell below 50%. Presiding officer, Scotland is taking action locally and being recognised globally. And Christiana Figueres, who is the head of the United Nations climate body, has cited Scotland's ambition on renewables and low carbon as a shining example to other countries. We have set the bar high with our world-leading targets and Scottish ministers have sought to push up global ambition since 2010. And for example, whilst in Lima last year, in my first days as a minister, I signed the Compact of States and Regions, an international reporting platform for subnational governments representing 12.5% of the world's GDP 
and over 325 million people. And this year, when attending the World Summit Climate and Territories in Lyon, I signed the Under 2 MOU, another initiative between sub-national governments aimed at promoting high ambition ahead of Paris. And in this milestone year, the international community will have to match Scotland's commitment if the Paris Summit is to produce a truly effective global response on climate change. And we hope that the Paris Summit will be a big step forward. It's crucial, Standing Officer, that we push further to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius or less if we are to avoid the worst impacts of climate change falling on the world's poorest and most vulnerable people. And although Scotland's targets are challenging, with much still to do, I want to emphasise today that we are making good progress. Now, this morning, I laid before Parliament Scotland's report on progress towards meeting its interim target. And this report shows that in each of the years, from 2010 to 2013, the percentage reductions that we have achieved have exceeded those set out along the trajectory to meet the 42% reduction in 2020. And in fact, Scotland's emissions have fallen by 38.4% from the 1990 baseline, leaving just a further 6% reduction to meet the 2020 target over the next seven years. Presiding officer, Scotland is clearly on track to meet its interim 2020 target. I believe that is a message that we should focus on. It is a fantastic achievement. And of course we know that the Act requires even greater reductions to meet the 2050 target. There is no room for complacency, and nor will we fail to recognise the challenges in meeting Scotland's annual targets. Now, I recognise that the other report I laid today shows that Scotland's 2013 annual target has been narrowly missed by 1.7 megatons. Now, once again, presiding officer, this is because of revisions to the baseline since the time when the fixed targets were set. Now, I highlighted that in my statement to Parliament on the publication of the 2013 Scottish Greenhouse Gas Statistics in June this year. And in June, I also explained that changes to the methodology for calculating emissions have added 10.6 megatons to the 1990 baseline, making it harder to meet the annual target. And despite that, presenting officer, Scotland's emissions have fallen by 38.4% from the baseline, which is far greater than the 31.7% reduction envisaged when the target for 2013 was set. Presenting officer, had it not been for successive increases to the baseline, Scotland would have met and exceeded our target for 2013 and the three previous years. So against the 2020 and the 2050 targets, Scotland is making significant progress. But we know that we must continue to lift the pace of our actions against our fixed annual targets. And that's why in June, I announced further measures on energy efficiency, environment and transport aimed at reducing Scotland's emissions. And as I also indicated in June, we will be ensuring that climate change is a top priority through a cabinet agreement to embed climate change in the autumn budget process. I remain determined, presiding officer, that we make up for the cumulative shortfall that has resulted from Scotland's missed annual targets. And we will do this by ensuring that our RPP3 addresses this, as well as setting out measures required to reduce emissions out to 2032, fulfilling our statutory requirements under sections 35 and 36 of the Act. But it's not just about government. It will take continued commitment and action by all of us if Scotland is to achieve the emission reductions required. And that's why the production of RPP3 will be a wide participative process, building collective ownership and responsibility. And we will have a conversation with people across Scotland, listening to their views on climate change and the actions that we must collectively take. Now, we've started that conversation, presenting officer, with events planned with community groups in the new year. And given the impact of decisions made now on future generations, we must give a voice to the next generation of Scottish leaders by involving the 2050 Climate Group. 
And of course, engaging the Scottish Parliament will be a key element, with opportunities being developed to get involved alongside regular parliamentary business. And these are just a few of the plans that were being put in place to make sure that our RPP3 is a truly collective endeavour. So, presiding officer, I call on this parliament to agree that commitment and action are required from all of us if Scotland is to continue to lead by example in tackling climate change. That is the message that I want us to take to Paris, demonstrating Scottish leadership and encouraging others to step up and embrace the climate change challenge that we all face. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions on issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow no more than 20 minutes for questions, after which we must move on. Uh, it would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request button now. And I call Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for advance notice of her statement? Minister, failure in the last four years means that 18 megatons of carbon is now in our atmosphere, which wouldn't have been there had the targets been met. That's equivalent to the whole of the Scottish energy sector's output in one year. Progress on renewables is nowhere near enough to compensate for failure on farming, transport, housing, buildings and infrastructure. The Minister mentions a billion pounds spending in the budget. Is this new money and will she publish details of these projects now? Given the rise in public sector emissions and failure on housing, surely the National Infrastructure Project must be brought forward to start now. And will the Scottish Government sign up to the existing Homes Alliance asks? Section 36 of the Act requires ministers to detail how they'll make up for missed targets in the early years. Where is that report, Minister? Today's report confirms that there has been no reduction in household emissions and the Climate Act enables householders to get discounts on their council tax for energy efficiency measures. Yet last year, two households in the whole of Scotland benefited, only two. Is the Minister proud of that? Her predecessor, sitting beside her, correctly stated that failure to sort out our leaky drafty homes was a regular vulnerability which needed efficiency and decarbonisation of electricity, heat and generation. But we're not seeing that. And pride in renewable heat is a staggering lack of ambition given the low target set. I'm glad the Minister's going to Paris, but without radical action, Today's statement and our act is meaningless. This statement reeks of complacency. Minister. Oh, that was uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I say to Sarah Boyack, you know, our achievements, we have a long list of achievements and they demonstrate the good progress that we are making. On energy consumption, our target to reduce consumption by 12% by 2020 is already at the required level in 2013 down by 13.3% from the 2005-07 baseline. On heat, the amount of heat that generated by renewable sources in Scotland grew by 36% during 2014. On housing, we have allocated over half a billion pounds Arthur. since 2009 on a raft of fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes. And we continue to focus on increasing the energy efficiency of homes in Scotland to tackle fuel poverty with a budget of £119 million for the current year, 2015-16. On renewables, our provisional annual statistics for 2014 show that the equivalent of 49.6% of Scotland's gross electricity consumption came from renewables, and that is just short of our interim target of 50% by 2015. On community and locally owned energy, we announced on the 17th of September that we have reached our target of 500 megawatts of renewables capacity by 2020, five years early. On transport, compared to 2013-14, we have increased investment in active travel by over 80%, from £21.35 million in 2013-14 to £39.2 million in 2015-16. And that is at a time when our overall capital budget has decreased by 26%. Now, in terms of the Section 36 report, 
And Sarah Boyat will know producing a credible package of proposals and policies to make up that shortfall that's totalling 17.5 million metric tonnes of CO2 equivalent from previous annual targets and to get back on track to meet future annual targets will take time. Therefore, it is our intention that RPP3, as I set out, it will set out proposals and policies in detail to compensate in future years for the excess emissions from previous annual targets and it is planned to lay a draft of RPP3 for scrutiny by the Parliament towards the end of 2016. We are making significant progress, Presiding Officer. We have cut our emissions by 38.4%. We are more than three quarters of the way towards meeting our 42% emission reduction in 2020 ahead of schedule. Alex Ferguson. Alex Ferguson. Apologies, Prime Officer, I didn't, I didn't hear you call my name. Um, can I also thank the Minister uh, for the advance copy of her statement, which, with the best will in the world, does seem to bear remarkable similarity to last year's statement. However, in amongst all the good stuff, and I do not deny that there is good stuff within that statement, it is deeply disappointing that the Government has yet again missed its target the fourth year in a row. The Government has never actually met its target. And that begins to get, surely, much more than just deeply disappointing, because every time a target is missed, the gap between where we began and where we want to get to increases. Now, the Minister blames baseline revision. She did so last year as well. So can I ask her why allowances do not appear to be made for these baseline revisions that we all know are coming as the annual targets and basis of policy is considered? Um, the Minister says that she will fulfil Section 36 of the Climate Change Act. But she seemed to indicate, uh, in answer to Sarah Boyack, that she would do so by, through RPP3. Well, I don't believe RPP3 fulfills Section 36 of the Climate Change Act. Sarah Boyack asked, where is that Section 36 report? And I would repeat that call. Finally, uh, Presiding Officer, forestry planting has a major role to play in emissions reductions. Thousands of hectares have been felled to make way for wind farms over the last few years, and they are supposed to be replaced by compensatory planting. So could the Minister tell us how many hectares of compensatory planting have taken place over the last three years, and what percentage that makes up of the total area of timber felled for wind farm development? And if she cannot tell me in, uh, today, which I would quite understand, would she undertake to write to me with those figures? Minister. Can I say to Alex Ferguson that the fixed annual targets they were established on the basis of the 1990 to 2008 inventory in order to meet an emission reduction of 42% by 2020. Now, since then, that baseline has risen by 10.6 megatons. Now, given the effect of cumulative upwards revisions to the inventories since the targets were established, the percentage reductions required to achieve the fixed targets are now out of line with the 42% reduction target. And as I said before, if it hadn't been for successive increases to the baseline since the targets were established, Scotland would have met and exceeded its annual target for this year and the three previous years also. Now, the reason why we have missed our fixed annual emission targets is due to the changes in the way in which the data is calculated as a result of methodological improvements. Now, the level of progress that Scotland can make in reducing emissions is also dependent on the policies and actions of others, especially the UK and the EU. The UK government cuts to energy efficiency and renewable measures are creating a worrying climate of uncertainty for low carbon policy in the UK. Now, Lord Dabin, who is the Chair of the Committee on Climate Change, in a letter to the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change at Amber Rudd on the 22nd of September said, and I quote, the uncertainty that's created by changes to existing policies and a lack of replacement policies up to and after 2020 could well lead to stop-start investment, higher costs and a risk that targets to reduce emissions will be missed. In terms of your specific point around on the forestry, I will, I'm happy to answer the member in full. Uh, in terms of our target, RPP2 was clear that the target of 10,000 hectares per year was an average over the period to 20. 
2022. Now, we are reversing the historic decline in woodland planting rates, protecting this important carbon sink. In 2013, forestry was the only sector in which there has been a net emissions sink. Planting rates have increased, presenting officer, to an average of 8,000 hectares per year during the period 2011 to 2012 to 2014 15, which equates to around 16 million uh, trees a year. And with the launch of the new uh, Scottish Rural Development Programme, we aim to raise the planting rates from 2015. Rob Gibson, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, President Officer. I'm sure the Minister will join with me in welcoming the third Peatland Forum and Conference that starts in my constituency today. Uh, methane levels have been increasingly marked up in the greenhouse gas inventory. In what ways have the measurement of methane emissions from deep peat, such as the flow country in Caithness and Sutherland, helped to meet our stretching Scottish climate change targets? Minister. The new international reporting requirements, which came into force for the 2013 inventory, they have increased the potency of methane as a greenhouse gas and makes it harder to meet our fixed annual targets. The measurement of methane in deep peat is not currently required under the greenhouse gas inventory under international reporting requirements. However, work is underway to estimate emissions caused by the human influence from drainage and re-wetting of peatland, and it is intended that these emissions will be included in the greenhouse gas inventory once research has been completed. But whilst this work continues, we have been supporting restoration through Scottish Natural Heritage-led Peatland Action Initiative and the new SRDP. Thank you. Before I call Claudia Beamish, can I just point out that Ms Beamish has hurt her foot. Um, so she has my sympathy, but more important, she's got my permission to stay seated for her contributions. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the lead up to Paris, climate justice will be at the heart of Scottish policies. What is the Scottish Government doing to ensure a just transition uh, strategy is in place, supporting communities likely to be affected? And how is the Minister working with other, other Ministers to ensure that transferable skills leading to new local jobs are going to benefit those in the fossil fuel industries who are losing their jobs now, but also for the long term future? Minister. Well, climate change, as I say, we strongly recognise the poor and the vulnerable at home and abroad are the first to be affected by climate change and they will suffer the worst, yet they have done little or nothing uh, to cause the problem. And the injustices and in all of that you know, is very clear and that's why the Scottish Government is championing uh, climate justice. Now, the Scottish, we want to make sure that what we see is a just transition to a low carbon economy with the burdens of climate change and the benefits of the low carbon economy shared equitably. Now, the Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights that commits Scotland to continue to champion climate justice and to make sure that we are developing a coordinated approach to climate justice at home and abroad, embedding climate justice in the national performance framework and aligning it with the UN's post-2015 sustainable development goals. We also have our innovative £6 million climate justice fund, which is supporting 11 water adaptation projects <coughs> in four sub-Saharan African countries, Malawi, Zambia, Rwanda and Tanzania. And we have £3.8 million from our international development fund since 2012 for community energy projects in Malawi. In the international engagements that I have been undertaking, presenting officer, I have also been championing uh, climate justice, which I did so at the World Climate Summit in Lyon, where I had the opportunity to do so during a plenary session. GMD, followed by Tavis Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One in every four of Dundee City Council's cars and vans are now electric, and in conjunction with Transport Scotland, a further £1 million has been invested in EV infrastructure across the city, contributing to one in 15 of the taxis there being electric in Dundee, boasting one of the largest and fastest growing fleets of electric car club vehicles. But can I ask the Minister whether that progress is being mirrored across the other 31 local authority areas, or do we need greater buy in from our councils if we are to get transport emissions down to something resembling an acceptable? level. Minister. Um, backed by £2.5 million of funding from Transport Scotland's Switched On Fleets Initiative, Scotland's local authorities are leading the way in the adoption of electric vehicles. Now, in a 2014 survey of 433 councils in the UK regarding how many uh, electric vehicles they had in their fleets, 
four of the top five were from Scotland. Dundee came top with South Lanarkshire, uh, Glasgow City Council and Fife Council placing second, third and fifth respectively. Dundee is the only Scottish local authority on the shortlist for the UK Government's electric taxi scheme and the Go Ultra uh, low city scheme. If successful, these bids are worth more than £20 million to Dundee and its partners and I'm sure that we would all want to wish uh, Dundee every success with their bids. We will obviously we will share learning uh, from the Dundee work across the country to enable the city and ultimately Scotland to be globally recognised as a leader for innovative electric vehicle deployment. Travis Scott, followed by Gil Patterson. Thank you very much, Mr. Daniels. Can I thank the Minister for an advanced copy of her statement? She told Parliament just now that the RPP uh, will not be produced and not be laid before Parliament until the end of 2016. But my reading of the, 20, of the Climate Change Act says that a Section 36 report should be produced and it's in law as soon as is reasonably practicable. Is the end of 2016 as soon as is reasonably practicable? Minister. Um, I would say to Tavish Scott that we also have to go through a very thorough and form, uh, consultation process as well, and also in terms of our opportunity to be able to lay that report in time for Parliament to make sure that we give it the proper scrutiny that it deserves, as well as across the scrutiny from the other parliamentary committees as well. Gil Patterson, followed by Patrick Harvey. Hey, thanks, Presiding Officer. It's clear that action on climate change requires action at every level and by all. What will the, the government do to encourage individuals and organ organisations to play their part? Minister. Well, there is already a, a wide range of action on climate change being taken by individuals, families, communities, businesses and other organisations right across Scotland, but we need to continue to do more. Our national ambitions to tackle climate change will only be realised by people across Scotland taking action. The pace of the transition to a low-carbon society will be determined by how we as individuals, households and communities adapt and change our behaviours. And that's why in the new year, as part of the development of further measures to tackle climate change between now and 2032, we will be asking people across Scotland for their views on climate change and what action we can collectively take, because all of us, presiding officer, including businesses, the public sector, communities and individuals, have a vital role to play. Patrick Harvey, followed by Mike McMahon. Thank you. There's been much talk of baseline revisions, but the government has the power under the Act to come back to Parliament and ask to revise the targets themselves. They haven't done so, in my view, quite rightly, but surely we must draw from that that these targets remain reachable and that the commitment is still there to reach these annual targets. Therefore, wouldn't today have been a good day for the Minister to come to Parliament and tell us how much money is attached to the National Infrastructure Priority on Energy Efficiency and when that work will begin? Has the Minister been told by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance how much money is available? Minister. Can I say in terms of Patrick Harvey's uh, questions that the, um, on the Committee on Climate Change, when it published its uh, report, the Scotland Progress report, uh, back in March, in terms of it set out in its report about inventory, inventory changes have made our legislative targets much harder to reach. And they have also said that they will work with the Scottish Government to address the issue for the inventory changes are pending. They have recommended that the Scottish Government should continue to investigate further abatement from measures that go beyond our current policies. And we also propose to agree a process and timeline with the Scottish Government to advise on the implications for Scottish targets of significantly improved inventory data that is expected later in 2015 and again in 2017. So we will continue to work with the Committee on Climate Change around that. In terms of the progress that we have been making, for our improving the energy efficiency of Scotland's homes and non-domestic buildings. So the detail of that programme is being developed, but it will be a truly national programme providing support for all buildings across Scotland. We will work closely with stakeholders to design and develop the new programme over the next two years. In terms of the spending route, I obviously can't preempt any discussions around that, but the Cabinet and Subcommittee, we have agreed that we will be embedding climate change within the budget process. Finally, Michael McMahon. Thank you. Um, and I thank the, the Minister for her statement, but note that the Minister congratulated herself on reducing the levels of fuel poverty. Does she accept, however, that almost one third of Scots remain in fuel poverty and that this is completely unacceptable? Does she recognise that only 30 per cent of privately owned or rented homes achieve an energy performance certificate of C rating, with 65 per cent achieving D and E rates? Will she commit to giving the same emphasis and investment to the private housing sector that are coming currently directs towards the social housing sector. Minister. 
When we've already allocated over half a billion pounds since 2009 on a raft of fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes, nearly one in three of our households, over 700,000, have now received energy efficiency support. Tackling fuel poverty, presiding officer, remains a priority for this government. And this year, we are spending unprecedented amounts on fuel poverty and energy efficiency with a record budget of £119 million for 2015-16. Thank you. Can I uh, apologise to the four members that have been unable to call um, for this statement? We need to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 14297. In the name of Margaret Mitchell on the Apologies Scotland Bill, members who wish to take part in the debate should press.